Just give me about 30 seconds and I'm going to turn the uh, screen share on so that people can uh, show, uh, people can see slides. Um, okay, so now we're showing Zoom and uh, now, okay. Um, do people see the first slide? Okay, excellent. Um, so I guess, um, so what I wanted to um, talk about here is uh, kind of start off with a general overview of what uh, of quadratic funding, aka quadratic matching, aka liberal, liberal radicalism uh, is, uh, kind of what, what this mechanism does, what the purpose of this mechanism is. Um, and um, after this, go through a, um, what, something really interesting that uh, we did in uh, the Ethereum community about a month, uh, well, really over the course of the last year, where we actually tried to apply this mechanism to um, basically fund public goods inside of the Ethereum ecosystem and some of the progress um, and, and, and some of the kind of results and learnings that we got from that. Um, so, um, by the way, how many minutes do I, uh, do I have again just? Uh, 45 minutes. 45, oh, excellent, okay. Um, so to start off, like, like what is quadratic funding, right? Um, so I'll start by framing this with um, what problem quadratic funding is trying to solve. Uh, so you know, the public goods funding problem, um, this is uh, a very kind of big problem that all the communities and the kind of society and the community as a whole faces. And it's a type of what's called the tragedy of the commons. Um, and the general setup of this problem is basically that you have some community of people, let's say 1,000 people, and each of them can donate money or contribute effort to help maintain some public resource. It could be a public park, it could be a bridge, it could be um, something much more abstract um, that you know you can't like put a toll on even if you wanted to like scientific research or independent journalism or uh, a whole bunch of things um, and the challenge um, is um, that if each of these people were to make an individual donation to support this project then each person would absorb basically all of the cost of their donation themselves, but they would only get one thousandth of the benefit. And so if you kind of think of everyone as only taking into account their own interests, then because whether or not they personally contribute to the public good um, only has a very, very tiny impact on whether or not the public good gets produced or the extent to which the uh, public good gets produced, um, then but at the same time, it doesn't um, influence uh, kind of the, like whether or not you donate doesn't really um, influence anything else that happens to you directly, except for the fact that you lose money. Um, so, like basically, it's in no, it's in no one's interest to donate, right? Um, now, in reality, people are more altruistic than uh, the economic models say, like, as we all know. But uh, even still, it's not nearly enough, right? Like we've seen individual donations kind of succeed to some extent but really fail to be anywhere close to enough to fund of a lot of the big uh, public goods that we really care about so this is the usual setup of the public goods prop funding problem right you have these public goods and we want to um, try to fund them um and but this kind of mechan mechanism of individual donations just kind of isn't up to the task now the more subtle reality is that there's actually two problems, right? So the first problem is kind of the funding problem. Um, so basically, if people don't donate to this public good voluntarily, then right? But there's also the second problem that people talk about less. And the decision problem basically says, um, like, how do we even know um, which public goods are worth funding in the first place, right? So how do we actually decide like, what is an actual public good and not just what is one loud person's vanity project? Now, in the context of private goods, so things that benefit like one person, then markets actually end up solving both of these, right? The way that private goods are funded is 
if you want it, you buy it and you pay money to the first to the person who created it. Um, and if it's valuable, then like you, the, the market knows that it's valuable because people are willing to pay for it. Um, but in public goods, like because you don't have this mechanism where people are making individual decisions that individually decide whether or not everyone gets gets the product, like in a public good context, either everyone gets the product or no one does. Like we don't have this mechanism anymore, and so quadratic funding is a mechanism that, to try to solve the second problem. Right, so quadratic funding by itself, I mean, it doesn't really solve the first problem. Like it can uh, kind of elicit more donations, um, but it's uh, the mechanism is more kind of focused on the second problem, and it generally assumes that some of uh, some kind of source of funding exists, and it basically asks, well, if this source of funding exists, then how should we direct it? Um, and the idea here is to create a kind of market-like mechanism where people donate money, and there's a formula that takes into account how much uh, people, different people donated to different projects, and based on the different amounts of these donations, and it tries to calculate how much the project kind of would have gotten if all of the donors uh, perfectly coordinated with each other. Um, and it subsidizes the difference, right? So like, for example, if Alice donates a dollar, Bob donates a dollar, Charlie donates a dollar, then the mechanism would decide that, well, because Alice, Bob, and Charlie are each uh, kind of only um, in getting one third of the benefit from their donation, if they got all of the benefit from their donation, they would have donated $3, and then $3 times three people is $9, but they actually donated $3, and so the nine minus three, that extra six, and it gets given to the project out of this uh, subsidy pool. So the idea is to try to mathematically cancel out the uh, tragedy of the commons problem. And, the kind of more philosophical goals of this mechanism are like one way to think about this is that the mechanism is sort of democratic in the sense that it favors things uh, supported by broad groups of people over things uh, supported by small concentrated groups of people right so if you just rely on individual donations then it's very easy to have a kind of things that are supported by small concentrated groups of people kind of win out over things supported by broad groups of people, even if the broad interest is ultimately greater. And like we see this all the time in the context of political donations, for example. And quadratic funding is more kind of democratic in the sense that it, the formula kind of favors things um, that have more groups of people, larger groups of people actually do support. And the second goal is to be market-like, but in the sense of inviting information from the edges, so it doesn't assume that there's some small groups of, of uh, technocrats in the middle that know everything. Um, and also, um, this is very important, right? People criticize democracy all the time for like, tyranny of the majority, two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner and all of those things. Now, quadratic funding is not majoritarian. It does allow different groups with uh, different views of what's important to coexist and uh, both get their needs satisfied. So gone through the philosophy, here's the math, right? So for every project, uh, the people um, that have the ability to participate in the mechanism can make donations to the project. Then we take the square root of uh, each individual contribution, we um, add the square roots together, and we take the uh, square of the sum as the output, right? So in, in this uh, kind of graph, like the, the individual contributions are the squares along the diagonal axis, and then if you put the squares up kind of beside each other in that way, then the side of the square is the square root, the size of the big square is the sum of squares, and then the big kind of yellow and green thing together is the f kind of the full amount, right? And the, the green is the amount that people uh, donate, um, but donated themselves already. The, and the difference between the two, the yellow, is the subsidy. Now, a lot of the time, there is going to be not enough money to kind of fully cover the yellow part, to, or to fully cover the theoretically optimal subsidy for every project. 
And so we calculate partial subsidies, right? So one way is to just kind of divide everyone's subsidy by the same constant. Um, and if you assume that none of the aid participants are cooperating with each other, then this is optimal, but there is other ways too. So intuitions for why quadratic funding makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some different intuitions. Um, one of them is that um, if N people uh, each donate $1, then the total size of the square is gonna be N squared, right? And so if there's N people that donate, the um, each individual per person's donation gets multiplied by N, right? N people each donate $1, so there's N dollars of raw donations. Quadratic funding gives you N squared. And so I mean, all of the donations sort of get multiplied by N. And if there is a scenario where N people are donating, um, then there's a set of one to N tragedy of the commons. Uh, so there's like basically, if you are donating, then you are um, paying the full cost of your donation. You're only getting one over N of the benefit. But here we multiply by them N. Um, and so well, basically we're subsidizing you N to one. And so the cost and the benefit are both divided by N. And so it balances out. Um, another intuition is that smaller participants kind of in this individual donation mechanism, so like without any subsidies, um, small participants uh, get hurt by tragedy of the commons more. Uh, so political donations are kind of the uh, the source of intuition you want to kind of go back to here, right? So if just some individual, um, you know, regular middle class person um, donates a hundred dollars to a politician, then there's this big kind of tragedy of the commons that's uh, kind of getting in the way. And so people do donate, but they would donate kind of less than they other uh, kind of would if they took all of their interests into account. But some extremely rich person is kind of is hurt by the tragedy of the commons less because an extremely rich person is able to kind of individually make a much bigger impact. And so they're able to individually feel the results of uh, whatever whatever it is that they're supporting. And quadratic funding counteracts this because quadratic funding multiplies small contributions more than it multiplies big contributions, right? So yeah, like because the formula is based on the square roots, uh, so if you imagine kind of one other square being added on, like added to the top of the, uh, of the, the square that's in the diagram here, then if someone donates $1, then the square has a side length of one. And so you add one to the sides of the square. If a person donates, uh, say, $100, then the, it's a 10 by 10 square. And so 10 gets added to each side of the square, right? So for kind of small individual donations, an individual um, has effect is kind of proportional to the square root of how much money they give. And so small contributions get multiplied much more than big contributions. Um, if you're a math nerd, there's also this kind of fun equivalent to quadratic voting, which is basically that each player is uh, kind of by making a donation and paying some amount CI is making kind of square root of CI quadratic votes. And, you can model, and that, right, so we model the um, kind of participant, the subsidy pool as this kind of virtual agent that's voting against the donation. Um, because it's losing money and it's losing the size kind of the amount that's in this big square. And so it votes against it basically by making kind of an amount of votes that's equal to the sum of the square roots to kind of balance out everyone that's voting in favor of it. So if you kind of care about kind of quadratic voting math, that's interesting to think about. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Um, so let's put theory into practice, right? So. We have this mechanism where people can donate money to projects and based on how much money different people donate different amounts of money to the project. And there is a subsidy pool that gives some extra amount of money on, on, on top. But like, how well does this actually work? Um, so in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, we have uh, this uh, kind of pro platform called uh, Gitcoin Grants where People that are doing projects uh, that benefit the Ethereum ecosystem have the ability to set up profiles and basically seek donations. 
Um, and over the last year, um, Gitcoin has been doing this experiment with the quadratic funding, right? Where basically there is this um, subsidy pool. Um, for the last round, it was $100,000. It was funded by the Ethereum Foundation, Consensus, um, and a couple of other donors. Um, and the goal was to basically try quadratic funding in a real life setting and see what happens, right? Um, so, what happened, $100,000 matching pool, um, it ended up eliciting a total of $163,000 of donations, um, which is kind of way more than the math would expect. And so and the Ethereum community is much more public spirited than homo economicus, I guess, fortunately, um, from a community contributions. And there were 477 contributors that uh, donated money to 80 different projects. Um, and in this kind of chart, you can see what some of the kind of winners are, right? So number one is EthHub, which is this kind of community site that has a lot of um, information about Ethereum that kind of laid out in this way, very friendly to beginners. Um, Austin Griffiths is the developer that's been working on a lot, just a lot of different Ethereum kind of usability focused projects. Um, Number three is some lighthouse that's a you know, kind of client impl implementation, a software package that people can use to run in the Ethereum uh, 2.0 uh, uh, system when that comes out. Um, Ardai, and it's uh, kind of a, wrapped, uh, a wrapper around the, uh, the Dai stablecoin, Prism, a uh, Viper programming language. So a lot of different uh, projects, some technical, some community, uh, some educational, kind of some of everything. Um, so we can try to kind of use this as an experiment and see kind of what we learned about the outcomes, right? So one caveat in all of this is that like this, of course, reflects my own opinions of uh, kind of how important all of these different projects are. And in general, like you can't avoid are your own ideas of what's good and what's bad and what should be funded and what shouldn't be funded from influencing your opinion of how these governance mechanisms operate. But we should also be careful, right? Because the, like, the goal of these mechanisms is not to satisfy any one of us. The goal of these mechanisms is to try to kind of direct resources to things that are good for the whole community. Um, so a few results, right? So first, a boring result. Um, I thought the outcomes were broadly reasonable. So I thought that every project that got a significant amount of funding was one that deserved funding. So I thought EthHub deserved funding, um, Austin Griffiths deserved funding, Lighthouse deserved funding, Ardai, Prismatic, um, Viper, you know, these are all very good people and they're people that I'm happy managed to get the, at least a, a portion of the support that they deserve from, this, uh, from the quadratic funding pool. So that's a good result, right? So the mechanism did not break and it didn't do anything that's kind of terrible or like much worse than just like traditional centralized technocratic government. Um, interesting result number one, uh, community and adoption and kind of education themed projects were very popular. Uh, so if you go back to the slide with the top 10, you see number one is EthHub. It's a site for new people to get information about Ethereum. Um, number two is um, Austin Griffiths. Um, and um, he, well, the project that he was working on is something called Burner Wallet, which is this very easy to use uh, Ethereum wallet. Um, and that a lot of people just really love using as things like hackathons and other places. Um, there, is, uh, there are a couple of others, like there, it's not on economics.study and, edu and other educational resource kind of got up, or I think around number 14 or 15. And I mean, the other projects were technical, but like my own view is that the Ethereum Foundation's kind of centralized technocratic grant process ha like, has historically undervalued the uh, kind of community and adoption themed projects. And the community kind of identified that these things are important. And in my view, the community was that was correct in identifying that these things are important. So this is arguably an example of uh, Gitcoin grants 
actually outperforming, you know, outperforming a uh, more centralized approach. Um, interesting result number two. Um, so the Gitcoin Sustainability Fund. So this is the fund that kind of pays the people who actually run the Gitcoin mechanism and make it happen was not wanted. The number of contributors was small. The total amount was something like one thousand dollars. So it was kind of much smaller than it should have been, especially given that the like they are the people that made the rest of this quadratic funding thing possible in the first place. And the Ethereum Foundation uh, technocracy uh, did, in my view, kind of correctly support the Gitcoin, uh, the Gitcoin team itself with uh, significant grants, as it should have been. And the community, kind of, at least in my view, failed to catch this. Now, when I wrote the, uh, the blog post where I mentioned this, uh, I mean, I did get back some replies from people in the community about kind of why they didn't uh, support the Gitcoin Sustainability Fund. Um, and none of them thought that it was uh, kind of not worth supporting. So one of them said that they like, didn't, didn't uh, kind of market the fact that they had a sustainability fund. One of them said that, oh, get, there were actually three separate projects that were all connected to Gitcoin and people weren't sure which one they were supposed to donate to. And they kind of all of these different user experience issues. Um, some people like, really just kind of didn't realize and forget. And so it's very possible that this is something that will kind of improve over time. Um, so it's interesting to look at this in light of some kind of common stereotypes of like things like direct democracy, uh, things like markets as well. Uh, so like the positive stereotype is probably that direct democracy identifies what the people find valuable, um, even if kind of elites disagree or even if elites don't realize it. And it does seem like this happened uh, to some extent over here. Um, one of the more negative stereotypes is that direct democracy kind of over focuses on populist and glamorous things, but it doesn't support like boring but necessary things. So like even in a direct democracy, no one will bother to kind of take care of the sewage. And it does seem like this sort of stuff kind of happens here, but it's also possible that people will kind of will learn once uh, the, pro the problem gets highlighted. Um, direct democracy is tyranny of the majority, and so two wolves and a sheep voting for what's for dinner and all that. And definitely not here, right? So in this uh, quadratic funding thing, we did actually see a lot of different projects with a lot of different themes, even multiple competing projects uh, and of all get supported at the same time. And so it really, uh, the mechanism really is compatible with supporting and you know, a diversity of people are doing uh, doing stuff that people find valuable. Um, so we can go to go into a couple of uh, kind of details, right? So one of them is that um, round three uh, did not use regular quadratic funding. It used this version of quadratic funding uh, that I call pairwise bounded quadratic funding. And the idea here is basically to kind of limit the subsidy that you get for every pair of donors. And it, this had a couple of goals. So one of them is to sort of mitigate the risk from unexpected collusion between donors. So the math behind quadratic funding is kind of pessimistically assumes that no two participants are cooperating. But it turns out that if people supporting some projects are cooperating, people supporting other projects are not cooperating, then there's an opportunity for a pretty big imbalance. Um, and pairwise bounded quadratic funding kind of tries to mitigate this imbalance. Um, another goal is that it mitigates the kind of distortion that you can get from insiders to a project basically donating to themselves. And this actually is something that we saw in some of the earlier rounds. So we basically saw like a project where all of the employees to the project made kind of significant donations and then because of that, they ended up getting like a $20,000 matching and that had to kind of get removed manually. And uh, that had, like much less of that ended up kind of being necessary here because uh, the, like basically the mechanism itself limits the extent to which that sort of thing can be harmful. And a third goal is to give more support to projects that kind of get support from diverse communities as opposed to just getting support from groups of people that always support the same things together. Um, so it succeeded at the second goal. It succeeded at preventing these kind of insider self-donations. 
but like unfortunately there's this kind of negative result that like there's no real evidence so like no negative evidence no positive evidence regarding either of the other two goals but that's fine like those kinds of effects are, are might be effects that only appear once so the experiments are getting even larger um one challenge um, is a kind of dominance of large projects right so one possible challenge here is that large projects get economies of scale in kind of extracting funds from the system and what i mean by this is that you know, like n dollars of marketing can reach n people and get n squared returns um and so if you can spend n to get n squared then that could easily lead to and a small number of projects becoming dominant over time and we see here like projects that have more money contributed in total do end up having a higher matching ratio um and like this is on the one hand to be expected because they tend to be kind of more public goods but on the other hand like it's also not like you should expect there to be a small scale and a large scale public goods and kind of sm here small scale public goods don't really didn't really end up existing um at all to the same extent like if there is less than a hundred dollars contributed then the, then it was money that came from fewer people um and so one possible response to this is to kind of try exponents lower than two. So instead of square rooting and squaring, you would take like the power of two thirds and then the power of three halves at the end or something like this. But this is just one thing to kind of keep watching. Um, another challenge, identity. Uh, so a problem that this, uh, these systems have is that they are very identity dependent. So basically, if you're gonna donate $10, then you can always kind of if you can split the donation in half into uh, donations of five dollars each from two different people um, it would have a bigger impact that way right and fake identities are like actually not that hard to get so there's this some wonderful site buyax.com where you can just go and buy things like gmail accounts um, and so if this mechanism does get to a larger scale like you definitely expected to start getting exploited to hell by yeah like basically professionals that have uh, learned how to do this over the course of a decade from a social media land and so especially given that there's money and significant subsidies involved this is one of those things that's worth uh, trying to fight against and there's basically two solutions like one of them is centralized digital ids um so social media accounts is the thing that gitcoin is using right now and you could use something government issued like Estonian e-residency, for example, um, if you wanted something with a kind of higher security level. And another solution is decentralized ID, so basically like some form of community verification. So future directions, right? So this was this kind of first like really big trial of uh, quadratic funding that we managed to do in real life and we got a lot of and uh, very interesting insights and very interesting results out of it so like what is Bitcoin going to do in the future right so like first of all trying more further rounds and more consistent rounds and get to the point where instead of just being a novelty it's something where people actually rely on it for ongoing funding and try to actually see kind of where what kind of dynamics that ends up creating um, improving the quality of identity verification, that's something that you'll just kind of have to do if you have uh, something that's giving out like more than $100,000 of money because once these things they get to larger scales, people will cheat them. Um, another um, thing that, um, that we want to look at kind of technologically is that there is an entire branch of kind of cryptography that's dedicated to kind of trying to mitigate the possibility of collusion. Um, so this has been researched for decades in the context of electronic voting systems, but the general idea is to make systems where contributions are anonymous and contributions are, pri are private to even to the extent that you have no way to prove to someone else how you participated, even if it wants to. Um, and like you can see why this will be needed for regular voting because if you don't have this then like your people will be able to sell their votes and so like the main technology we use uh, to prevent this in real life is we have voting in person and we have secret ballots but replicating this electronically is a little harder but there's some really interesting 
uh, cryptographic tricks that can do that. And then finally, we can uh, kind of try kind of more specialized rounds of quadratic funding dedicated to specific uh, topics. So, like things like media, for example, would be would be one interesting topic to uh, try to do a uh, do a round of uh, quadratic funding for. I mean, we already have technology. Like we could even split it. But, um, media between things like journalism and um, things like documentation. Um, you could try to branch out uh, kind of beyond the Ethereum ecosystem itself and uh, try to go to like open source software more broadly or even go to things um, outside of the software world, possibly in some kind of, kind of uh, local geographical community. So a lot of possible directions to try. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation, and I guess I'm uh, quite happy to take uh, questions now. Um, let's see. Do people see me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, one question. How do you deal with the fact that the utility function of donations is not linear, meaning that uh, for some projects, at some point, it stops extra money, stops being useful for some projects below some amount, you're not useful, and so on. Is there any way to change the mechanism? I'm not hearing that? the question well, unfortunately. Um, so mm -hmm. in short, how do you, uh, is this, can you hear me now? No. A bit better. Um, so I'll repeat it short. Um, how do you deal with the fact that the utility of donations is not linear, meaning, yeah, non, various non-linear functions? He's asking, how do you use the, the fact that the uh, utility function is non-linear? Mm. Yes. Um, right. So theoretically, um, quadratic funding does have uh, a. The original paper from myself, Glenn and Zoe, that introduced quadratic funding, I mean, the proof that it does, it kind of looks at kind of marginal uh, kind of, uh, marginal incentives. So it basically proves that if, like, even if your your utility function is nonlinear, um, it would like you would still kind of continue donating up until the point where the kind of the, the social benefit is um, lower than. The, the uh, social uh, than the social cost, um, and the one thing that it does assume is it assumes convexity. So it assumes that like your utility function kind of is either linear or it uniformly goes down. It's not like some weird thing. Oh, excellent. I, I think that the basic idea is that because you can see the money accumulate. You can, if you know that at some point it's no longer useful to the project, then you'll stop giving. So that's like the basic thing that tries to address that. But, you know, do people know that? You know, there's many questions there. Like, do things have an incentive to like say, oh, we don't want any money beyond this point? <laughs> Even, you know, so, so there's, there's real issues there. But in theory, the, the theory that Vitalik was referring to is that by observing the money dynamically, you can avoid that like extra money that's not worth anything. Other questions? I'll, I'll try this combo. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Vitalik. Um, so my question yes. is. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so my my question is. Um, you said that you hope that it can, this can be used for more continuous um, community funding, and sort of the mm -hmm. way that it works, it seems to me like you can do it every year, but it's still going to be discontinuous. Like it, it seems like a model that's very, very hard to do for a very predictable stream of income. Like it'll be always more like Kickstarter and less like Patreon in a sense. And like, can you talk about that a bit? Oh, so I've been actually telling the Gitcoin people that they should do a round every two months. And, and I could see it being reasonable to even go up to monthly at some point. Like nothing stops the mechanism from kind of being applied on more frequent schedules. Okay, can you come up and ask your question? If you have a question, just come up to the laptop. Thank you. Hmm. 
Hi, sorry, I had to travel to the laptop. So uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned that there was more funding than the uh, normal economic models would suggest, and also more funding mm -hmm. for kind of community-based projects, um, which is evidence mm -hmm. of this like altruistic motivation that Glenn has spoken mm -hmm. about, this kind of over-altruism problem. Um, mm -hmm. So the question here basically is, um, if you're doing like quadratic financing within a community, you're only accounting for like the benefits to people within that community, um, but there are also like mm -hmm. externalities to people who wouldn't vote. For example, if you, you know, mm -hmm. have an election in the US that's gonna affect the entire world, um, you have like future mm -hmm. generations might be affected by these things and they can't really vote about these things. Um, so what are your thoughts on kind of accounting for those kinds of externalities of people who are not participating in the current mm -hmm. voting process? Um, and how does that relate to the kind of over altruism issue? Hmm. So I guess, uh, like, first of all, the kind of the mathematical ideal version of quadratic funding would probably say that everyone in the world has the ability to kind of run these things. Um, and like, if you start getting the problem that projects get funded that uh, negatively affect people, then you could also kind of extend quadratic funding so people can vote against projects. Um, and yeah, so you can definitely kind of extend it to kind of very wide groups of like potential participants. Um, the, now, extending it to people who like don't exist yet um, is, it's an interesting question. It's, uh, I mean, I guess to some extent, like the problem is that you can't really come up with a mechanism that Incur that encourages uh, kind of projects that benefit people that will exist into the future without kind of explicitly hard coding some idea of uh, what those people in the future will find valuable because that's not something that you can kind of go ahead and ask them immediately. And so you, know, you can try to do things like, for example, like if you care about this topic, then like you might want to donate to something to like, I don't know, the Long Now Foundation and they might have uh, a uh, kind of grant and, be, and a, a lot of people would donate to it. But I, and I do think there's something kind of inherent in, the, in this uh, kind of concept of democratic uh, and market-based mechanisms that it only kind of feeds in information about people that actually do have the ability to kind of participate right now. And if you want to move beyond that, then you'd have to kind of either code it in explicitly or rely on people within the mechanism caring about that problem enough to kind of vote in that direction. Thanks. Okay, we have time for one more question. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Vitalik. Uh, okay, so Hi. I'm curious how this translates to, say, government provision of public goods. So let's simplify the decision between allocating between education, health, and say climate change or global warming. So mm -hmm. education and health have a medium short-term payouts, whereas climate change is on a much long, longer timeline with lots of uncertainty but potentially catastrophic outcomes. Would quadratic public mm -hmm. funding lead to possibly uh, under provision of, uh, of a good like you know uh, climate change or um, even other public goods mm -hmm. like say certain disease states that have a low probability of occurring but would have catastrophic outcomes. Or, so, go ahead. Hmm. Just a quick follow-up, or could provision happen because it's precisely a popular issue but the sum of square roots reduces provision that would have otherwise happened? Hmm. I mean, if there's, uh, if there's an issue that, that really brings together kind of everyone and kind of everyone from different political aisles, then that's definitely something that quadratic funding is likely to kind of support more strongly. Um, I guess also kind of every mechanism is ultimately limited by its participants. And so if the only people participating in the quadratic funding are people who are kind of very short-sighted and like don't care about anything that, ha um, that happens more than 30 years in the future, then like, of course climate change would not be funded. So to some extent, like relying on any of these kind of mechanisms 
does, I think, unavoidably rely on kind of trusting in the goodness of people. But I mean, there definitely are a lot of people, like, a lot of people that really do and uh, strongly care about climate change. Uh, uh, climate change right now so and i'm optimistic there the other thing that's probably worth pointing out is um that like if there's weird dynamics that might happen if like one country or one organization and it adopts quadratic funding but other um, other countries uh, don't um, so in the case of climate change for example like if you set up a quadratic fund that only people say in the Netherlands can participate in, then I mean, they'll end up contributing a lot, but at the same time, like even that still, it's, it, the mechanism is only taking into account the wishes of people in Netherlands. That's not gonna be taking into account the, the, the wishes of people in other countries. And so just because your mechanism is on a smaller scale than global like you're going to under provide less but you will, but you'll still end up under providing to some extent um and that's uh something that i mean i'm not sure we can solve in this in the short term but i also kind of think that you know we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and we shouldn't let this be a, kind of something that you know grows over time Thank you. All right, so that wraps up our talk of Vitalik. Thank you, Vitalik, for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.